All right. Well, thanks for uh, rejoining us and welcome back. Uh, we're in the uh, final segment of um, the first day of CNI's uh, fall 2021 um, member meetings virtual event. And um, we'll conclude the day with two, um, two uh, project briefings. Um, for the first one, I am delighted to welcome uh, Huajin uh, Wang and uh, Melanie Ganey, both from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, they're going to talk to us about an end-to-end -end open science and data collaboration program. And one of the things that really caught my eye about this and um, I think is, is worth considering carefully um, is that they're, at least as I understand their work, um, and they will tell us about it a little bit more authoritatively in a moment, um, what they're really trying to do is engage the full research process as distinct from simply picking up outputs at the end of it, um, uh, which has been a more characteristic mode of engaging researchers at many institutions and one that has had very mixed success. Um, so I'm really interested to um, see what they have learned through this work and uh, how successful it's been. And with that, let me just thank you both for joining us and I'll go away and turn it over to you. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Melanie Ganey and I'm going to start the presentation talking about the Open Science and Data Collaborations Program at CMU. And then Wajin Wong will do the second half of the presentation. Um, in the first part of the talk, I'll be talking about the program and how we use it to support open science at Carnegie Mellon, and a little bit about how we adapted to the pandemic. Um, and then Wajin is going to talk about how we are currently developing instruments to assess the impact of the program. The mission of CMU Libraries is to create a 21st century library. Um, and in our minds, a big part of that will be supporting the future of science, um, which will be becoming increasingly more open. So to that end, we created the Open Science and Data Collaborations Program um, back in 2018. The last few years, we've been rapidly expanding the initiatives of the program, and we are currently turning to a phase of assessing the impact and success of those initiatives. When we talk about open science at Carnegie Mellon, we really try to frame it more as open research since we hope that our tools and services will be useful for researchers across the disciplines, not just the sciences, in spite of our own backgrounds as research scientists. Um, and when we talk about open science, this is a commonly used term in the community that refers to a wide variety of practices, um, many of which we support with the program. And when we talk to researchers, we also try to emphasize that the goal is really to make research products as fair as possible, meaning findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. There are five main categories or pillars of support in the program. We license tools and provide training for them that support collaboration and um, sharing research products publicly. We foster collaboration opportunities, particularly those that bring researchers across disciplines together. We do assessment, including benchmarking against our peer institutions, as well as research on the impact of open science. We provide training opportunities, both in the form of short workshops that cover open science practices and tools, as well as longer carpentry workshops that focus on programming in open source languages. And finally, we hold annual events. Um, two examples are our symposia, the Open Science Symposium and ADAR, Artificial Intelligence for Data Reuse Conferences. And I'd also like to note that um, we also work closely with specialists at CMU libraries that focus on open access publishing, open educational resources, as well as research data management, which are all um, closely related to open science. 
Um, when we talk about the program being end to end, we really mean that we have developed services that can be mapped onto all of the phases of the research life cycle. Um, everything from the beginning designing and planning stages to the end where researchers are publishing. So for example, um, some of our tools are really meant for that documentation or planning phase, um, such as Lab Archives, which is an electronic research notebook. Um, we then support R in Python with the Carpentries Workshops, which is really getting to the collecting and analyzing part of a research project. And then we support many platforms that can be used to publish um, research products, such as Protocols IO, Open Science Framework, as well as our institutional repository, KillTub. And then many of our events kind of touch on all of these phases of the life cycle. Um, and as I mentioned before, the services that are in the dash boxes represent um, services that our colleagues focus on, but we work closely with those folks to ensure that the users at CMU are really receiving holistic support for open science. I'd like to share an example from Carnegie Mellon that I think really highlights uh, the power of data sharing and collaboration. This is the Bolt 5000 data set. Um, this project was a collaboration between researchers in psychology and the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and they published this data set back in 2019 um, on KillTub, our institutional repository. And this was one of the first large data sets that we hosted on there. Um, and our former colleague, Anna von Gulick, worked with these researchers to help provide guidance on things like how to structure um, the data to optimize its reuse and other considerations around versioning and licensing. What is really novel about this data set is its sheer size. So in this project, um, the researchers scanned the brains of um, people that were looking at 5,000 natural scenes. And typically in these types of projects, um, a person might look at under 100 scenes, for example. So the really large size of the data set makes it really useful for computer vision scientists um, because typically their algorithms have been really difficult to apply to the smaller data sets. And this quote um, just speaks to the power of that collaboration. Um, this is from Nadine Chang, one of the researchers on the project in the Robotics Institute, and she said computer vision scientists and visual neuroscientists essentially have the same end goal to understand how to process and interpret visual information. And this data set has been really important in bridging that gap between these two research communities um, since it was designed and implemented um, as a collaboration between researchers in both um, disciplines. As I said, this data set was um, shared in KillTub as well as in some other uh, disciplinary specific repositories to help improve its discoverability. And if you look at the record in KillTub, you can see that since 2019, it's been downloaded almost 73,000 times. Um, there are already publications coming out that have cited this data set. So we're already seeing a large impact um, on the, from this data set. And I think it's just a really great example that we use a lot at Carnegie Mellon to illustrate the benefits of data sharing. When we talk about data sharing as well as other open science practices, uh, we really try to meet the researchers where they are, um, meaning that depending on their discipline, the types of data that they work with, or even the culture of their work group, um, which is often determined by the PI or the professor, um, they might have different attitudes or willingness to share data and other research products. So we interact with people at Carnegie Mellon that fall all along the spectrum. Um, there are many folks who uh, like to keep their data private because they um, have concerns about data sharing or they're just simply not interested in doing the work that that requires. Um, and then we meet many people that are doing some sharing because of the mandates from funders and publishers. And that's a great opportunity to talk to them about um, how they could share more if they wanted to. And then we also have a group of open science advocates and champions on campus um, that are really doing, um, you know, sharing all of their research products, the workflows, the code, um, the data sets, as well as the manuscripts. And we really work closely with those advocates um, to try and highlight the benefits of open science to the rest of the community. 
So you can take that gradient of open science attitudes and really map it onto most of our products or services so that we can really tailor the outreach to specific people on campus. And so one example here is how we might do outreach for um, the product protocols IO, which we license. And um, if you're not familiar with the platform, it's an open access repository for step-by-step -step research methods or protocols. Um, and I think we found it's useful for people no matter where they might fall on that spectrum. So for example, um, a person can choose to keep their protocols private on there or just share them with a, the members of their lab group, um, which many people um, like that option. And even though they're not publicly accessible at that point, it still does really help improve the reproducibility because they're version controlled. Um, so we do really encourage researchers to do even that. Um, but then what we're really trying to do here is move the needle to the right, where a researcher might then opt to make that protocol public or link to the protocol in their manuscript. And so, um, as I said, we're really willing to meet the researcher where they are, but we're always hoping to um, convince them, guide them towards the more public options if possible. Um, this is a service I like to highlight in terms of um, opportunities that the pandemic presented. So um, it's called the Data Collab, and basically this is a matchmaking service where we pair researchers that have these rich complex data sets with data scientists on campus that can analyze them. And if you go to the website, um, you can see a list of the projects that have been supported by the Data Collab. But one thing that was really interesting was that during um, the pandemic, particularly the early part of the pandemic, this really provided almost an internship-like opportunity for students who otherwise were having a difficult time finding internships. So it was incredibly useful in that context as well. And these quotes are from a pair of researchers that were matched by the service. Um, the top quote is from the person that collected the data saying, this project started in a way because of COVID. Data Collab gave me the confidence that this is doable and I don't have to do this all by myself. I'm referring to the fact that they didn't have to do all of the analysis themselves. And then the bottom quote is from the data scientist who said, I certainly did learn some new skills and use some of the work I've done only in theory on real data sets. Um, another um, thing we noticed during the pandemic was that there was an increased need for virtual collaboration tools. Um, so one example we're highlighting here is Lab Archives, the electronic research notebook platform. Um, and so in the sciences, there are still many people using um, paper notebooks. And um, we saw this increased adoption around the pandemic because as scientists had to start working from home more, it was so much easier for them to collaborate having all of their documentation and lab notes in the cloud. Um, and this is a quote from Sarah Werner, a PhD student in biological sciences, who says, I began using lab archives last fall, which has been intensely useful due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In March, when I prepared to work from home, I did not have to worry about taking home countless notebooks. I just brought my laptop home with me as usual. And so we really saw a large increased adoption of many of our um, cloud-based collaboration tools during the pandemic. Oops. Okay. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Wajin, who's going to talk about how we've been working recently on developing instruments for determining the impact and success, um, sorry, assessing the impact and success of the program. Thank you, Melanie. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so after we have running the program for now more than uh, almost three years, uh, we've seen that people are getting um, engage with us and we observe some uh, behavioral changes are starting to happen from research communities. Uh, so we really wonder exactly how much impact we're making and in what way. Um, oh, sorry, that's like, next slide. Um, so we want to be able to answer questions like uh, what are, who are our active users of our services and uh, how do they benefit from our program offerings in their daily work and how can we actually do more to support their research. So we started to look into the uh, several ways to assess our impact, both uh, 
quantitatively and qualitatively. Next slide. Uh, the first exercise we did was to develop a logic model. Um, well, I'll, honest, honestly, this wasn't actually the first, but we felt uh, in the end that it should have been done at the, as the first step. And we're very thankful that uh, one of our associate deans, uh, Brian Matthews, introduced us to this idea and helped to develop it. Um, so for this exercise, we started from listing out um, our activities in a spreadsheet that includes for each activity, what's our investment, what's our um, uh, output, and what are our goals. And then we summarize all these in the infograph like this. Uh, there's a lot of information to unpack here, uh, but let me walk you through. Uh, first, look at the two blue boxes here, our, um, our, our activities and outputs. Uh, so you can see in the first blue box, we have five groups of, of activities. From top to bottom, we have the tools, workshops, events, collaborations, and outreach efforts. And for each group, uh, we summarize their corresponding outputs in the second blue box here. Um, how much activities do we offer? How frequent? How many users participate? And uh, for some of them, we have how many pr uh, products users produce using our services. Um, so we also outlined our expected outcomes for um, our collective activities in the pink box here. Um, so which is the sh basically short, medium, long-term goals. Um, and turns out after we're doing the activity, it really aligned very well with our initial intention of um, establishing this program in the first place which is uh, to first help researchers learn about open and reproducible workflow, then help them to adopt such practices in their daily research, and then eventually hopefully help to uh, create a cultural shift in their communities and, and, and across disciplines. Uh, so working through such a logical model really helped us to think carefully about how each of our activities align with our overall goals uh, and plan strategically because um, it's some, uh, sometimes it's so easy to get excited about something new and forge forward with too many things and end up compromising quality for quantity. Um, in our version of the logic model, you may notice that um, we have also another measurement of impact of the partnership we've formed along the way. That's a, the last box here. Um, here we want to especially emphasize that we have a close relationship with the Mellon College of Science. Uh, we started our partnership in 2018 by hosting, co-hosting the first Open Science Symposium together. And most recently, we established the Emerald Cloud Lab Partnership. Um, for those who are uh, not fam familiar, the Cloud Lab is a AI-driven uh, laboratory where all equipments are remotely controlled. So no grad students in the lab. Um, and so for this, our open science program has been involved from the very beginning to support open sharing of the results produced from the uh, Cloud Lab. And you will hear more about this partnership on um, December 14th, where uh, there will be a closing keynote in the in-person CNI meeting. Uh, next slide. So in addition to this logic model, of course, we were also wanted to find some quantitative ways of measuring our program impact. Uh, so we've collected some data across all our services, integrated um, all these data together, the ones that we are able to integrate and ask some questions. Uh, so there are some derm uh, simple questions like who, uh, who are our users, who are our top users, and what disciplines are the most engaged with us. And there are some are more in depth and more difficult to answer, like how do people use our uh, active uh, tools or activities and why did it do that? And ultimately, ultimately um, we want to answer what impact we're making in people's research process and uh, maybe in the whole research ecosystem. Uh, next slide. Um, so we've been working on developing assessment metrics uh, framework uh, to answer these questions. What you're seeing here is still a work in progress, but uh, basically, we looked at metrics and variables in the data we already have. 
Uh, some are from the dashboards or directly from the vendor, and others are um, from, uh, for example, registration records. Uh, then we made some derivative metrics and variables based on um, the questions we'd like to answer and grouped all these metrics into a what we call a five Ws and one H uh, framework. Um, for example, for the who question, who are our users? Uh, we have this user affiliation directly collected. And for the how question, um, how do people use our services? We have, there's a red circle on the right here. We have activities or outputs uh, for each user. And this can be number of projects or number of events participated. And combining information, we can come up with a, der a derived metric, which is the super users. And this, pro uh, as I mentioned, this uh, frame framework is still work in progress and is very limited by what data is available to us. Uh, but from here, you can already extract some interesting patterns. And I'm, I'm gonna show you just a couple of uh, them over, uh, over here. Next slide. Uh, this plot you're looking at is provides a, a disciplinary information regarding how our use, uh, regarding who our users are. Um, so it's a summary of how many users uh, do we have uh, for each department um, based on their pr uh, preliminary affiliation, uh, the pr primary affiliation. And this data comes from a integrated data set where uh, the usage of a given service or activity is represented by a true or false value. And if, if it got a true in any of the services, then they're counted as a user. Um, so that you can see that the top college, top user is from the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy, which is followed by biology, university libraries, and psychology. So I think that um, results can partially be explained by the disciplinary culture. For example, we know that uh, Heinz College uh, has some of our biggest fans because of uh, the, based on our personal interactions and university libraries and psychology have been the leading forces for open science movement around the globe. Uh, but it's also really nice to see um, that some of the engineering and computer science departments also are uh, emerging uh, to the top. Uh, next slide. Uh, but we also know that having the most users um, doesn't really necess uh, necessarily re reflect our user activity. Um, so we also looked at how, uh, how active users actually are, uh, for example, by looking at number of projects per user. Uh, for this, we did at a tool or activity level, uh, instead of using all the overall integrated data set because each uh, platform has their own measurements. Uh, so this box, uh, box plot here is from the Killtub data, and it's a departmental breakdown of the number of uh, public uh, public items uh, public items owned by each user. Um, so there you, you're looking at the, only the top ten departments ranked by the median uh, median number. Uh, you can see that some of the new departments emerged on top, uh, that including. Uh, Pepper School of Business, Music, and Physics. And what you also might have noticed uh, is that there's a wide range of distribution patterns, uh, but overall, the, medium not, the medians are actually pretty low. They're, uh, they're less than five items per user, um, but there are some users who have shared a lot of items. Uh, for example, in the in psychology, there are many outliers over there. And these were, we call them super users. Next slide. So um, we're able to find out what these super users are and their depart departmental affiliation. Uh, of course, here the information is de-identified, but internally knowing who the supers are has been really helpful and valuable for us uh, to make some targeted outreach. Next slide. Um, and one of the important things for us to know about this, in, our impact is how to, um, how much we have changed the researcher's behavior over the years. Um, so from here, you can see that there has been an increase of a uh, number of depositors on Killtop and users um, that have accounts on 
uh, lab archives and protocols uh, IO. So every year since we started the program in 2018. Um, we would like to attribute the, this increase to the outreach effort of the Open Science and Data Collaborations Program and to claim the impact. But the, of course, we, we want to be really cautious about not jumping to conclusions because many factors might be at play here. Uh, that's including the uh, influence of pandemic. So we want to look at this um, down the road, look, look at this for the long term. Next slide. Uh, and finally, one of the most difficult things um, we think in the metrics framework to answer is the why question. Um, so why are people using our activities? What are the motivations? Is it for to meet the mandates to get credits or for some other reasons? Uh, for this type of questions, we'd really like to get direct feedback from users uh, through surveys, interviews. Um, and so the data we collected, uh, like I mentioned before, helped us to identify um, the super users. And then earlier this year, we reached out to the super users and assembled a open science advisory group from students, faculty, and research staff. And we've been asking them questions about their motivation to use our services, how their experience was, and um, <laughs> what else would like us to support them. Uh, and based on these in initial inputs, we hope to be able to uh, design surveys and interviews that are targeted to a certain communities or user groups and ask questions like uh, what I listed here, um, <clears throat> how, uh, whether or how much our services uh, save them time and money or whether and how much we have helped them to bring in grants, publications, collaborations, or get them better career options. Um, and also uh, whether we have uh, helped their specific community to adopt open science and create a cultural shift within their community. And eventually, um, next slide. So eventually we'd like to be able to answer the question, what impact are we making in the research landscape at large? Uh, we realize this is not an easy thing to assess. And so we really welcome collaborations and partnership with, from other institutions who are also interested in this topic. Next slide. So with this, um, last but, uh, but not least, I'd really like to thank my colleagues, my devoted colleagues um, who has been uh, helping uh, working on this project with us. We're a team of library faculty and staff, but not, uh, most of us don't have the open science in our job description, but we just volunteered our time together with the common goal of using data for social good and um, making the research more open and reproducible. So I'm really grateful uh, for everybody involved. And of course, also thank you for listening. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're eager to, again, we're eager to hear your feedback, input, and we're happy to answer questions. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, that's the the the, uh, the measurement um, uh, impact assessment tool is really uh, extensive. That's that's really interesting data. Um, we probably have time for one quick question before we uh, move on. Um, if somebody wants to drop it in the chat or um, raise their hand or whatever, um, floor is open. Thanks, Cliff, about the um, um, plug about ADAR. Oh yeah, that's a that, that's a really good conference. I hope it's going to um, start happening again. Yeah, we hope. <laughs> yeah, it got a little um, got a little interrupted by the pandemic, like so many things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think um, I think we'll go ahead and move on. Um, I do also want to just echo um, the the point that Hujun made about um, the Cloud Lab um, uh, 
closing plenary for the in-person meeting, which we will be also videotaping for those who won't be at the uh, in-person meeting and will subsequently make that available. But that's, that's an absolutely fascinating complementary piece to this. Um, and I think you'll find it very interesting. All right, um, we will pause for just a moment now. Uh, thanks again, Melanie. Thank you, uh, Hujai. Thanks for having us. Thank you, our pleasure.